All right. So I've got a streaming now. Let's close that. So again, we're looking at page 84 to get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's do this. We'll go to speaker view, get me up there. I'm going to start with a screen share of page 84, I believe. Maybe. Okay, where is this? Uh, we need to go to this one. And let's see here. So we're in chapter five now. There we go. Page 84. So Newton's first law. A lot of you have an idea about Newton's first law. <clears throat> You've probably heard it. An object in motion stays in motion and an object at rest stays at rest. There's an important second half of those sentences. Unless it's acted on by a net external force, non-zero. Obviously, zero net external force would be pretty boring. But so this last half of the sentence is, is part of the piece that people forget. So um, and now if an object is at rest, it's going to stay at rest unless you push on it. Right. So that's kind of a big deal. Said another way, an object moves with constant velocity unless you act on it. And this is a shorter way of saying both of those two sentences, I think. It covers both cases, right? So at rest is a special velocity of zero, but in motion is also a velocity, right? So, and we should be clear, velocity requires magnitude and direction, right? So you're going to move in a straight line unless you've been acted upon by a non-zero uh, force. And here's another way of saying all this. If the net force, so that sigma, capital sigma there means sum of forces is zero. If the sum of forces is zero, then your acceleration is zero. Now think carefully. A common misconception, people think if the force acting on you is zero, they think you're not moving. That is not true. In general, you're not accelerating. And there's a subtle difference here. So if we look at this, let me see here, let's stop the share. What I, oh, that's not what we want to look at. All right. So I like to think about a plane sometimes. This is supposed to be an airplane. So let's say this is your airplane here, all right? Now, there's some forces acting on this airplane. There's a force forwards from the thruster. I might call that capital T for thrust, all right? There's a force downwards. That's your weight. And sometimes in this class, we will actually call that mg. Okay, so there's a weight. There's a force that helps you go upwards. That's your lift force. So I'll just call that L. And then uh, air resistance. Man, I tell you what, it's a real drag sometimes. That's bad. But yeah, so we have drag going to the left. All right. So imagine you have an airplane that's flying. The thruster is pushing it forwards. The wings are causing lift, which goes upwards. There's weight pulling it downwards. And then there's drag pushing it to the left. It's very plausible for all of you to imagine a situation where a plane is flying with constant velocity. It's flying in a straight line at the same speed. That doesn't mean there's not any forces acting on it. It means the net force is zero. And it doesn't mean that it's not moving. So this case where an object is moving, if we say A equals zero, that implies the velocity is constant, not zero. It's a constant. This is called dynamic equilibrium. Okay, so we're going to use, I might as well write out equilibrium if I can fit it in here. I can't, so I'm going to write equilib. So dynamic equilibrium is simply 
A is equal to zero, the forces are zero, but velocity is non-zero. Yeah, okay. So, all right, great. Now I sent out some videos from earlier. That's cool. Just let's focus on this now. We could talk about that during office hours. Um, they're cool though, yeah. Uh, so in this case, static equilibrium might be a simpler case. Let me show you a case of static equilibrium. How about you put a box on a table and it sits there. There's a weight force, which is mg. There's a normal force holding it up and it's sitting there. And in this case, A is equal to zero and velocity also happens to be zero. Now in this problem, what I really want you to get out of this or what I'm trying to show you here is this, the sum of forces is equal to mass times acceleration. If you have no acceleration, there's no net force, but that in itself tells us nothing about the velocity. That is what you were supposed to get out of this. It's possible to have velocity constant and non-zero or zero, but either way, we say that you're in equilibrium if A equals zero. So in general, this is a phrase in physics, if A equals zero, then equilibrium. That's what equilibrium means to a physicist. Equilibrium does not mean static equilibrium where it's at rest as well. It could mean that, or it could mean this. So that's equilibrium. The word equilibrium to a physicist simply means A is zero. One of these two cases applies. Any questions about that? Just a definition. All right, so let's go back and take a look at our screen. <clears throat> All right, so Newton's first law is actually included in Newton's second law. So notice this, Newton's second law is actually the one we're gonna use most of the time. They're very similar, but if you said A equal to zero in this equation, the force is equal to zero. We just saw that, all right? This is a good way to think of it. Acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. So let me get something up here. So if we're looking, let's say two objects have the same net force. So this symbol simply means net force. Give me just a second to get out of the way. This is net force or sum of forces. Same thing, net force, sum of forces. So acceleration is equal to uh, net force over the mass. So Again, we see that net force and acceleration are linked. Those obviously relate to your velocity, but it doesn't directly tell us that. If you recall, if we wanted to find velocity from acceleration, I know that A is equal to dV dt, right? And when we separate the variables, we get dV is equal to A dt, and we could integrate these things from initial to final. Now, if we don't know the initial value of velocity, we don't know the velocity from this problem. Obviously, the acceleration will relate to it, but it doesn't tell us the velocity directly. Okay, enough said on that. However, what if two objects have the same size net force, but this one has a much larger mass? Well, what Newton was saying was this. You give me a large mass, I'll give you a small acceleration. So for two objects with the same size net force, the bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration. Here's a case in point. Well, actually, let me, let me do one more. Let me see if there's any questions about that. And obviously, here's an example. Imagine a train, a train with like 50, 60 cars in it, it would have a huge mass. Okay, that means trains accelerate and decelerate slowly, right? You don't see a change. Uh, sorry, remember, uh, acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. So uh, a train will not change its velocity very quickly. That doesn't mean a train can't be going 200 miles an hour 
right? Trains can go very fast, bullet trains. It's just they can't get up to speed or slow down quickly. That's what this is saying, all right? Uh, all right. Uh, I was saying this earlier to the other class, like a hummingbird. Imagine how low the mass of a hummingbird is. A hummingbird has an extremely small mass, and so and it's moving its wings what very quickly. So it could actually, for a small force, because of its low mass, it could accelerate very quickly all over the place. So uh, that's the opposite way of thinking about that. Or a bug, right? Bugs can whip around all over the place, and it's hard to keep track of them. They change their velocity rapidly. They could accelerate rapidly. All right. Let's go back into here. Oh, question. Okay. So in static equilibrium, A is very zero and V is zero. Yes, uh, yes, that is correct. If it's an unmoving object, we get that bonus piece of information. They're telling us the velocity as well. So if an object is sitting still, that's what tells you velocity is zero, not the fact that A equals zero. All right. All right, let's get back into here. All right, so, um, and... You might have heard the term inertia before. Inertia, mass, we can use those terms pretty much interchangeably for right now. All right. So if you have a lot of mass, you have a lot of inertia. You resist changes in velocity. You have small acceleration. So large mass, small a, large mass, resist changes in velocity. All right. And um, so let's take a look at this one. Take a look at 5.1, a tale of two strings. And actually, you could look at all of these problems on this page, okay? 5.1, the broomstick and the tablecloth trick. So let's start with this one here. You have a ball. It's tied to the ceiling with a string, and the second string is tied to the bottom, and a student is going to give a quick jerk on the bottom string versus the teacher doing it, and the teacher slowly pulls the string. So let me see if this helps. Let's go to here. Let's go to here. Let's go to, wait, is it down here? Oh my gosh, there it is. All right, so you can't really see this very well, but I do want to point out there are these are not just magically hanging there. There's a string right there and there's a string right there, string here and a string here. Angus, that's this guy right over here on this side. He's going to pull very quickly and I'm going to pull very slowly. So this side's going to be the slow. This side's going to be the fast. Think to yourself, which string should break for each case? Okay, let's take a look. I'm going to hit play. I hope, I hope you could see that it, on the slow side, oops, give me a second. On the slow side, the upper string broke, whereas on the fast side, the lower string broke. If you can't see that, hopefully you could tell because this mass did not fall down, right? The one on the right, the fast mass did not fall down. So in this case, what is the physics of this? Well, if we think about this, the idea is supposed to relate to these equations right here. In both of these cases, we're using a string and a very large mass. So if you pull very quickly, pop, even if you apply a large force, if you have a really large mass, the acceleration is small. That means on the side where you pull very quickly, pop, the mass is so big, it doesn't have time to move much. If it doesn't move much, the upper string doesn't have time to stretch much, and the lower string breaks. On the other case, you're still applying a force, but you're applying it gradually. As you do that, the upper string has plenty of time to have, uh, the, the large mass has plenty of time to transmit that force information basically up to the upper string. And so as you're pulling down slowly, the upper string is feeling that large increase 
the whole time. And so the upper string not only has to port, support the mass, but also the additional force of you pulling on it. So in that case, the lower string only has the force of you pulling on it. The upper string has the force of you pulling on it plus this extra weight. And that's why the upper string breaks when you pull slowly. There's a number of experiments like this that relate to this quick, fast stuff. Let me find another one for you. Or any questions about that? Well, I've got it. Let's take a look at another one. Oops, and then, um, hold on, let me see this. When I share screen, isn't there a button to share the sound to? This one's got a fun sound on it. So normally I don't share videos, but um, go back to here, move this zoom window. And let me see here. There it is. So here's a video of the broomstick on the wine glasses. Now, this is the second one on that page. And I know, let me do this. Hold on. Let me move this out of here. Let me move this to here. Let me do this back. Now, one of the things that you can't see, it's a little blurry, in the ends of this broomstick, I put some pins. And those pins are what's resting on the edge of this wine glass. So this is what class used to look like when we were in person. It was a lot of fun. I'd let the students break stuff. So those are real wine glasses filled with, uh, well, colored water. I wasn't going to bring in wine. Let's give them a count. Ready? <laughs> Totally hit the cameraman. Hey! All right. Whoops. Oh, whoops. How do I get out of there? Let me escape out. Hold on. So the point being here, this is another one of those examples of if you apply force quickly enough, the force information doesn't have time to transmit all the way to the pins at the end. And so the glass itself, the, the pins don't move down that much because that Oh, well, you're hitting this with a large pipe that's got a tremendous amount of mass. And so you smash right through that before the information. Obviously, if you just push down on it, everything would shatter. And that happens many times during this demo in class when the student doesn't swing it just right. But uh, yeah, same thing with the tablecloth. If you pull the tablecloth out really quick, we see that that situation, uh, if you pull it slowly, you just drag all the dishes off the table. If you pull it very quickly, you're applying a force for a very short amount of time. The masses of the plates and stuff are large, so they have a small acceleration for a small amount of time. They don't move much. They still move, but not that much. As a result, it looks like they don't move at all. But yeah, so that's kind of the idea here. Now, I'll, I'll point out something else here. Um, so if you look at all these things, um, these are all actually relating the, the quantities inertia and impulse. So here's some kind of brief summaries of these things. Uh, and that's the stuff that I just said. So if you want to know about those uh, fun demonstrations, that's great. Why do we care about this? We're trying, those are supposed to help you kind of believe this statement that acceleration relates to force over mass. Uh, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to show that. All right, um, basically large mass, small acceleration, those examples are supposed to show that. Um, questions about that? Okay, all right, so now let's try this one here. Um, look at, do me a favor, look at page 86 at the bottom, problem 5.13. 5.13 at the bottom of page 86. Oops, this one. Think to yourself, which way is this tube going to go? Okay, or sorry, not tube. You're going to flick a marble in here. So this is, uh, to be clear, we're looking down on this. This is like sitting on the ground or on top of a table. And so I'm going to flick the marble through the tube. When it comes out of the tube, which way will it go? All right. And then think, which of Newton's laws tends to support that? Well, you're thinking about that. Again, this is the bottom of page 86. Let's go take a look. So here's the, here's the situation. 
And then just to make this, I'm going to slow this down a little bit. We'll go half speed. Notice once it leaves the tube, it travels in a straight line. This is supposed to tell you about Newton's first law, right? When it's in the tube and it's moving, initially it's moving this way and there's a force towards the center which causes it to bend slightly. And so the idea is while it's in the tube, the forces from the tube cause it to travel in a non-straight line path. Once it leaves the tube, and so let me draw a couple more here, right? At any given time, there's a velocity here and there's maybe a force towards the center. In that case, if there is a force that is non-zero, you can have velocity in a curved path. So once it leaves here, notice the ball travels in a straight line because there's no longer the force from the tube causing it to deviate from the straight line path. This is supposed to demonstrate an object in motion stays in motion along a straight line path with constant velocity unless there's some other force. All right, so there's that one. That's just to give you a conceptual idea that this is not all hocus pocus that I'm telling you. All right, all right. Um, do you like it when I show you these videos or is it a time waste? What do, what do you think? Is it helping? I like it. <laughs> all right, cool. It takes, sometimes it takes a lot of time to make these videos. I had a, like a 10 second video that took two hours the other day. So um, yeah, it's really, as long as you guys like it, I'll keep doing it. But if you don't, I'm, geez, I got, I got a life to live too, you know? All right. So um, sounds like that's good. All right. Now let's look back at your workbook. I want you to go to page 88 really quick. Page 88. Uh, let's go to page 88. Just skip it around a little bit. Um, Newton's third law. This is the one students screw up all the fricking time. So um, I just want to point out, uh, this is, you've probably heard it as action reaction, right? So some people say for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I like saying it maybe this way because that's how I did say it, right? This is me writing this crap. So force object one exerts on object two is equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction to the force that two exerts on one. Whoa. So another way I like to say it is this. If I push on a wall, the wall pushes back on me the same amount in the opposite way. So to be clear, that's what I'm talking about right here. Now, in this case, I'm going to push on this whiteboard. I weigh about uh, 240 pounds. I'm a big dude. This thing weighs probably, uh, I don't know, 20 pounds. It's pretty light, right? So, all right. So the idea here is if I push on this object, who's exerting more force here? Me or the whiteboard? Who's pushing harder on who? It'd be the same. The same. Now, Who's accelerating less? You are? Me. And that's the idea right here. My mass is the big one. Our forces are the same. I have a small acceleration. The whiteboard has a big one. Now, they're obviously accelerating in different directions. If I push hard enough on this, watch my body carefully. If I push hard enough on this, I'll probably break something. But, right, I, I, I'm trying not to exaggerate here. But so I do move slightly backwards. I don't know if you could tell. I have to at least move my foot to catch myself from falling, right? So I very slightly accelerate backwards, whereas this one accelerates a lot. So when I do that, I am accelerating the other direction. It's just a lot smaller than this one. Now think about this. If you jump, right? If I'm jumping up in the air, I pushed the earth downwards. Yeah! 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 Now, the earth pushed me up. Who pushed harder in that case? Somebody else. Equal force. Equal force. Wait a minute. If we're pushing with the same force, oh, that's right. The earth in that case is the big mass, and I'm the small mass. And so, right, 
we notice that the earth doesn't accelerate much at all. And so we can't observe it. I accelerate a lot. So generally speaking, whoever has the larger mass, you don't notice their acceleration. That doesn't mean there isn't a force on them. It just means their acceleration is so small, you don't notice it. Think about driving a car into an insect. The insect feels a massive acceleration that causes its entire body to splatter on the windshield and it dies. Whereas your car, you don't have to take your foot off the gas that much because you're not even going to notice that insect hitting you. That doesn't mean it doesn't exert the same amount of forces. It's just that that amount of force is negligible on your mass. It has negligible effect on your acceleration, which is what we observe. All right. So um, how about this one? Let's try another one. Let's go to this one. 5.20. This is at the bottom of page 89. 5.20, bottom of page, um, bottom of page 89. Take a second to read it. Think about it. I'll give you two minutes. You're on the clock here for two minutes. So about 5.02, we're going to talk about this. Try not to look at the answers. Another 30 seconds, and then we're going to talk about it. All right, so it's 5.02 now. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. I apologize if I'm going too quickly. Uh, you know, you can live stream it again later and slow it down or whatever. But let's try and talk about this. Okay, so this is a real life picture. This person's moving. And let's assume initially the person is moving downwards, right? They're moving downwards. At this point, their toes just make contact. I hope you agree they're still moving downwards right here. Right. Otherwise, if they were not moving downwards, they wouldn't end up in a crouch. And if you've ever watched anybody jump when they land, you do go down a little bit. All right. And then at the end, we're going to say you come to rest. So that's what's trying to be uh, shown in those pictures here. So between stages two and three, so between two and three, there's a normal force and the person's weight. Which one's larger or are they the same? And I forgot to erase this. This used to be a test question. So anyway, forget that. But yeah, what do you think? The weight is larger. Okay. And what makes you say the weight is larger? Kind of give me the reasoning in your brain. Uh, so, well, so they're still falling and yep. they do have a normal force and it's pushing back, but they're still like going down and crouching. So they're pushing harder on the earth. That's okay, like that's your thought process. Normal force. And then somebody else thinks it's the normal force. So why do you think it's the normal force, whoever that was? Well, because your weight and gravity doesn't change, right? Unless you pick up an object. So, But you are pushing down on the earth and the earth is pushing back on you. So okay. why normal force has to increase because of that, right? Okay, I think both of you agree that the normal force points upwards. 
and weight points downwards, right? And so to be clear, there's a weight force here that's mg, and there's a normal force here that's n. And I'm going to talk about these symbols in just a minute, but this n means normal force. This mg means uh, your weight. Well, huh. Which way are you accelerating between stages two and three? Downwards. Are you? Upwards, because you're decelerating. Oh, right? Do yeah, you you're see starting it? to decelerate right there. Orig Let's say my original velocity was negative two, right? Meters per second. And then here, the final velocity is zero. The change is final minus initial, which is positive. So the change is upwards. You're accelerating upwards. So if you're accelerating upwards, which force is winning? The normal force. Got it? And that yeah, is a tricky sense. question. So now how about, uh, so let me see. Um, okay. Oh, so that's which force is larger on the person. And then the person exerts a normal force on the earth, whereas the earth is exerting a normal force on the person. Which one of those is larger? So think about part B now. As you're landing, the earth is exerting that normal force upwards on the person, whereas the person is pushing down on the earth. Which one of those forces is larger? The equal same by newton's third law and this is the one people get weirded out by they say well i don't notice the earth move and that's just because it has such a large mass so how about part c so if you had me for physics 110 you'd better not screw up part c now that said if you have not had me for physics 110 or physics class before you might not know exactly what i'm looking here so if you had me for 110, don't speak up right now. Let's let the people who have not had me for class before try to get used to me here. So we've often, or we're going to discuss action-reaction pairs, okay? Between stages two and three, let's talk about the weight of the person as the action. So weight is the action in the action-reaction pair. What is the reaction force? Answer by completing this sentence down here. So if you've already had me for Physics 110, don't answer right now. Somebody else, it's okay to completely fail, but do give it a shot. So, um, and the sooner we get through this, the sooner I'll show you a video clip. So t just take a stab at it, fill in that sentence. I'll give you a second to think. And if you had me for 110, you should be thinking about it and hopefully you get it right. Okay. So somebody take a stab at it. It's okay to completely fail. Just someone who didn't have me for physics 110, try to fill in the blanks in that sentence. What object is exerting the force? Is it the earth? Okay, so you're saying the earth exerts what type of force? Normal. And that's not right, it turns out. Okay, yeah, and so th that's what everybody thinks. And that's what I was trying to trick somebody into saying so I could clear this up. It turns out that doesn't make sense. A, it turns out, let me, let me clear this out. Thank you for trying, and I, I appreciate that. I'm going to go up to right here. The most common misconception in physics is this. Normal force and weight are never an action-reaction pair. Never, ever. Look at how many times I say this. My 110 students, they miss this every time. Here is the trick. Okay. These are the facts about this. Okay. Uh, object. Okay. So action and reaction always act on different objects. They always point opposite directions and they're always the same type of forces. Uh, okay, so that might help us. So um, if we go down to here now, the idea here is, well, 
in this case, I'm going to write this one this way. So the action is the weight force. So let's write this out. What is the weight force? Earth exerts a gravitational force. I'm just going to say grav downwards on the human. So what is the reaction? We've got to flip it. What object is doing the exerting? The human. The human exerts what type of force? Well, what do we just learn about um, reaction forces? They're always the same. What's the direction? Upward. On the? Earth. And then you got it. And this is very, very counterintuitive. Most of us do not think about ourselves as exerting forces on the Earth. Why? Because the Earth is so massive, we'd never notice it accelerating. But I'm going to show you something here. Not only am I going to show off my impressive two-inch vertical, I'm also going to pull the Earth upwards. Ready? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm doing it again. Oh, yeah. I just pulled the Earth upwards. Every time you jump in the air, you push down on the Earth. And then when you're, right, the whole time you're in the air, you're pulling the Earth back up towards your feet. Now, the Earth is pulling you down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. Sorry. My bad. I told you I was a big dude. But um, yeah, um, the, the issue is this, our mass is so small compared to the, um, to the Earth's mass that we don't notice the, right, we, when we push the Earth down, the Earth doesn't go down that much. And then when we're up in the air and we're both pulling back together, we don't notice it that much. But maybe you remember recently uh, in the news, they were like, uh, um, somebody landed on a comet and they were digging in the comet to try and get some ice and bring it back to earth or some, or, or something like that. Right. And, or to get some samples. Now, the thing about that was if you're just on an asteroid and you're trying to explode into it and dig pieces out, it's quite possible. The act of digging into the comet could cause you to push so hard, you fly away from it and it, and you never come back together. But in that case, you might actually be able to see it. If you push off the surface a little bit, you might actually be able to see both the comet and the spaceship move slightly. So depending on the sizes of the objects, this might become more noticeable. I should stop talking about that. But yeah, um, let me see what's in the chat there. Okay, got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, just under two meters. Just under two meters. All right. Let's see. Um, Let's get back into this. This one right here. So um, I was gonna show you a video to make sure you believe this. Let me see here. Hold on. There it is. So in this case, I, that's a 27 Newton ball. And I'm going to drop it on here. Now on the screen back here, there's a screen. This is going to read force versus time. Okay, so we're going to look at the force versus time for this ball. So I'm going to just drop this and let it run. And I'm going to speed this up so it doesn't take all day. All right, so I'm going to run this. Notice it bounced. I'm going to play that again, just in case you didn't see that. It bounced a couple of times. And now when we get into here, again, this is the force. Right here, that is time. And so this is being measured in seconds. This is being measured in Newtons. And now right here, the first part of it, there's nothing going on. That's because the ball was being held in the air. 
This is when it first hits the scale. It spikes right there. This is when it hits it a second time. And finally, I don't know if you could tell this, but right there is the third time it hits the scale and then it settles in. And I'll point this out. I'm just kind of trying to emphasize the line. We see right here, it's in the air. Right here, it's in the air. But there's a couple of periods in time where the force spikes well over the weight. This number right here is 27 Newtons. That's when the thing is just sitting on the scale and you can read it. We see that you have to exert more force than 27 Newtons to stop a 27 Newton ball, right? You not only have to hold it up, but you also have to stop its downwards motion. This corresponds to those accelerating upwards phases that we saw. Questions about that while I have it on the, on the screen here. This is just confirming this isn't a lie, right? A scale must produce a force larger than the weight of the ball during impact. Otherwise, it won't stop. All right. Here's another one. Um, oops, come on. There's the 27 Newtons. All right. Uh, this one's not exactly the same. So um, in this case, <laughs> I'm trying to do the opposite. So now I want you to think this through. I'm starting in the crouched position and I'm going to jump. So imagine what the uh, force versus time graph will look like. So take a second to think. I'm gonna sit here, I'm in my crouched position. I'm gonna turn the scale on and then I'm gonna jump off the scale. Imagine what the force should look like. Massive vertical, massive. <laughs> oh, whoops. Let me give you a second here. I'm going to blow it up on the screen. Just give me a second. All right. So again, this is force in Newtons on this axis. The vertical axis is the force. The horizontal axis is the time in seconds. We see here, this is me trying to remain motionless. And then I jump off the scale. I need more force than my weight. So this is about a thousand Newtons, if you will, something like that. I think it's maybe 1100 Newtons. That's a big dude. Okay. Now I need a force almost double that to get just two inches of air. And then notice here, right at the very end, the force reading goes to zero. That's when I'm not on the scale anymore. So we see you need this huge force to get off the scale. All right. So this again makes sense. This is, uh, all right, let's leave, let's leave it at that. Unless there's questions on that. It's just showing you the answers to that question were not made up, just direct measurements of that. Go ahead. So for when you jumped up, mm -hmm. you, you kind of like exploded up. That's why right. it's more like vertical. Right. But if you were to go slowly, yeah, if you just stand very slowly, if you could do it very, very slowly, you might not even notice it on the scale. So think about this. When I'm just standing here all the time, I'm kind of rocking back and forth and maybe going this way and moving slightly. I'm exaggerating it now. But right when you're just standing still, you might shift your weight from foot to foot. And as a result, your center of mass, the center of your body makes slight movements up and down. If you look at that, you could see that on the screen I am trying to eventually, maybe, is this going to work today? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to show you right here. This is me just trying to hold still. You can see that just holding still, the scale moves back and forth from me kind of rocking my body left and right. And as I do that, my center of mass moves slightly up and down. When I cause my center of mass to accelerate upwards, the force goes a little bit high. And then when I cause my center of mass to go downwards, it goes a little bit low. It goes a little bit high, a little bit low, a little bit high. So now what Alonzo was saying was if you very slowly stand up, you might just see this kind of continue and you might not even notice it. It would look like that if you just slowly stand up. So if, oops. So like in this case right here, if I just start like this and I move up like at about this pace, you might never even notice the, the exaggerated force reading on the scale. 
because it's such a gradual change, my acceleration is so small, the extra force required is negligible compared to my weight. Is that good? Yeah. Nice. Great thinking. Good job. Other questions? All right. All right. Um, so let's take a look here. Um, let me mention some things and then we'll start getting into problems. So these conceptual understanding is actually pretty important for you to succeed in the class. Come on, let me get out of this. All right. So let me get out of there. Um, and so some things that you might want to know these problems on page 89, all of these problems here are simply figure out Newton's third law as it applies to this situation. Can you write down action reaction pairs? So um, here's ones for cars and, and like taking a turn with the door. These are common misconceptions people have. This one relates to that one we just looked at where you're talking about a car that's taking a turn. You can think about the marble that's having a turn. All right. Um, so, uh, or when you walk and things like that. So those are good questions to do. Here is the, um, the helpful hints on how to solve that. That's on page 88. So pages 88 and 89 will help you conceptually. Great. Going back to here. Whoops, give me a second. Somewhere. These two laws, uh, right? Newton's first law and Newton's second law. We usually just remember the second one because if A is equal to zero, we include it. So these ones, we also do a lot of problems because we have equations to work with. And so we're gonna try and spend some time today going over some sample problems and some specific tricks that are pragmatic ways to help you. Regarding that, let's now look at page 83. On page 83, I'm gonna show you the symbols I like to use. Are these the only symbols? Absolutely not. If you read different textbooks, Every textbook will use different symbols for some things. That said, you're using my notes because this is my class. So I'm telling you what symbols I'm going to use. And I'll give you the other ones as well as we go through here. So um, forces are vectors with magnitudes and direction. A lot of times what we do is we try to get just the magnitude of the normal force or the magnitude of a tension in a problem or the magnitude of a weight or the magnitude of a frictional force. So to be clear here, these symbols that I'm drawing in here are talking about force magnitudes. Forces are going to have a magnitude and a direction. The units for force are Newtons. Okay, what is a Newton? Well, you may remember from chapter one, we mentioned that a Newton is a kilogram, per, a kilogram meter per second squared. I like to think about it like this. Mg is the most famous force that we all know from high school physics or physics 110. Well, Mg, if I write that here, the units of this are kilograms. The units of G are meters per second squared. Just think of the units of force as being the units of Mg. So you know that they're Newtons, or you could think about it as being the units of Mg. Either way, that will get the job done. So in a physics problem, if you end up with an answer for a force and it has G in it, but no M, you know you didn't do it right. Your forces are usually proportional to Mg, not just mass, not just G. All right, that's the units. Next, let's go through some of these symbols that we're gonna use. All right, so in this case, there's the normal force. If you're reading some books, maybe you had a high school physics teacher, I don't know, sometimes they do this, F subscript M, totally valid. That said, I usually just write lowercase n. Now to be clear, I use a lowercase n for normal force, capital N for Newtons, the units of normal force. So to be clear, the units of N equal capital N. And you may be saying, well, dude, why are you doing that? Why don't we just do this cap? Because I know what's coming and I have a reason for doing it this way. So just trust me. That's what I'll say about that. If you don't believe me, that's cool. You can do whatever you want, right? If you get the answers right, great. All right. Now, um, tension. Usually we're going to use capital T 
For time, we use lowercase t. So time in this class, if we could just be consistent, we're gonna try and use lowercase t for time, okay? Tension is gonna be capital T, torque is gonna be a Greek letter T, and period is gonna be a different letter T. There's a lot of T's. All right, gravity. Near Earth's surface, we could just use this. So for most problems in this chapter and the next 10 chapters, or actually the next eight chapters, we're gonna do this. This one right here, we're gonna talk about in chapter 13. So we will get to that in this class towards the end of the semester. So if you're curious. Now, some pet peeves. Gravity is a force. G, think about it. What are the units of G? Meters per second squared. That is clearly not a Newton's, right? That's not Newton's. It's not gravity. So when you say G is gravity, I just cringe and want to just give up. So remember, G is the magnitude of acceleration due to gravity in free fall. Now, if you say G is gravity, everybody's going to know what you mean, but it's just going to drive anybody that's a scientist or an engineer crazy. So if you're trying to get a job in that field, start using the terms correctly, okay? That said, if you're computer science and it doesn't really matter, eh, whatever, okay. I, I still think you should use it correctly. All right, friction. Sometimes some books will say force due to F, like this. And that's fine, but I'm gonna try and use this symbol, lowercase f. Capital F, I'm gonna use for a push or pull. I'll get to the chat in just a second. So a lot of problems say a zombie is pushing on this block or uh, uh, an undead creature is pulling a block with force F. Uh, okay, so that's what I'm gonna use for capital F. And then let me just check the chat. Yeah, that bigger one is for uh, basically if you're at radii that are large compared to the Earth's surface or if you go to a different planet. So that will work for, um, remember that problem I said where there's a spaceship and an asteroid? Mass one would be the spaceship. Mass two could be the asteroid. All right, so if that helps, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, and we'll do that in chapter 13 in detail. So for now, just assume it's MG all the time. All right, um, so those are some comments I have on that. Springs, okay, this is a very common one. Notice in this chapter, you have to be very careful with this. You're gonna see this, see the difference a couple of times. Notice one of these equations is a vector equation and one of them is a magnitude equation. The magnitude of a spring force depends on how much it's stretched and some weird constant. We're gonna talk about that in chapter seven. So if you're curious, that's chapter seven. I think maybe chapter seven and eight. We'll worry about that then. Electric forces, that's physics 163. Okay, <laughs> oh, but I say maybe you should actually pay attention in chapter 13 so you suffer less later. All right, so, and then obviously there's many other types of forces, but there's strong forces, weak forces, et cetera. Let's worry about that later. Let's see if there's anything I missed here. Uh, most of this we got, most of this we got, okay. Um, and, oh yeah, typically we, we're gonna try and draw force pictures. You saw me do this already. Let me go to the board. So in this case, imagine you had a picture of this block here sitting on a table, right? Now you could draw this like this. You could say the weight is going downwards. So that might be force magnitude mg. And you could say, that the normal force is pushing downwards with a negative number. I hope you agree that's a terrible idea, right? Normally we wanna think, huh, the force should be going this way and that means this should be a positive number for the magnitude. In some unusual cases, notably a type two superconductor above a magnetic track, a negative normal force might actually make sense. But generally speaking, unless we're in some really weird situation, we want to draw our pictures so that the arrows tell us the plus minus signs and these numbers are all positive. So this is a normal force magnitude. N should be greater than zero. Both of those numbers should be greater than zero. G is a positive number, right? It's 9.8. It's the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. It's not the acceleration. It's the magnitude of it. So it's a positive number.
So generally, try to draw your pictures so that forces are going the right way so that when you solve for magnitude, it's positive. That's what that last comment was saying. All right. So at this point, if you've had me for class before, you may want to start grinding away on problems because you already know a little bit about what I expect for a free body diagram and how to draw things. That said, I'm gonna do a couple simple problems to show you some tricks and the way I like to draw things and the standard ways of writing things. And there'll be a video occasionally to go with it. All right, so um, let's get into here. Oops, sorry, I was in there. Let's start simple, 5.3. Okay, you're in an elevator, you're accelerating downwards. I'm gonna show you how I would do this problem. All right, so hopefully you have enough time to read it really quick. And again, you've got it in front of you, page 85, number 5.3. Okay, so I want you to see the board with me while I do this one. So this is 5.3, page 85. Making sure I didn't screw that up. Yep, okay. There's an object. I wanna do what's called a free body diagram of that object. Now, a lot of people will say force body diagram. That drives me crazy. I know what you mean, but it's not right. FBD means free body diagram, not force body diagram, okay? Free body diagram. What does that mean? You draw one body, one object, all by itself. Done. Usually, you just put a dot there, at least in these early chapters. Now, there's a force acting on it. What's one of the forces acting on this particular object in question 5.3? 5, 5 What's one force? Tension. Tension. So there's a tension going this way. What else? Somebody else. A weight. A weight. Okay. Now, some of you are probably used to using the symbol lowercase w. That's true, that's fine. All right, so what? I'm gonna use mg all the time for weight. That's just a physics habit. You'll see why later. Now, this thing is supposedly accelerating, right? Which way was it accelerating? Downwards? Yeah, downwards. Thanks. So it's accelerating downwards with magnitude A. Now, there are many, many, many correct ways to do this problem. Well, probably about three or four that most people might think of. I'm gonna show you what goes on in my brain so that you can understand my solutions. That's what matters here is I want you to be able to use my solutions effectively. I'm not saying I'm doing it the right way, but I can tell you this. I've probably done a lot more of these problems than you have I think it would be smart to listen to me, right? I've done more problems of these than most people in the world because how many other people have written whole books on this, right? So I would listen to me. That said, if you can get the answer right another way, full credit. That said, here's what I like to do. I am trying to use Newton's second law. This is Newton's second law. Sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. This part comes from the arrows. So right here, the sum of forces comes from the arrows and this is just mass times acceleration. Notice the acceleration is not touching the object. Acceleration has units of meters per second squared. It is not a force. Acceleration relates to force with this equation but it is not a force. Acceleration does not touch the object in a free body diagram. Only forces touch the object. Next, I'm going to use these arrowheads relative to the coordinate system to write down this answer here. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean. 
tension, according to this coordinate system, is it positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Oh. In this one. It's tension in the positive J hat, according to this coordinate. Remember, we're doing 5-3. I think the next problem flips the coordinates. You might have been looking at that one. Next, MG, positive or negative? Negative. 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 Okay, then mass times acceleration positive or negative? Gee, I wonder. Negative J hat. Now, what cancels out of each term? The J hat, right? But not the plus minus signs. You see that? That's what I was going for here. The minus signs matter. Basically, the arrowheads relative to these give you that minus sign. Let me check the chat. Okay. All right. So when I clean this up, this is sometimes how you'll see it written. Sometimes what you'll see is someone writes sum of forces in the y direction. So this means J hat parts. That way you don't even waste time writing the J hats. Then you would say T minus MG equals, in this case, what would it equal? Negative MA. Negative MA. And people oftentimes miss this minus sign because they're so busy worried about these arrows, they forget to check the relative direction up there. So this would say negative MA. Okay. This can then be solved for the tension. So if you rearrange this for the tension, we get tension equals something. What do you get? Uh, the mass factors out. Was it G minus A? Yeah, that's what I got. Okay. All right. So now here's what we see. This actually relates to all those videos we just did a second ago. All right. Think about this. If you're accelerating downwards like this claim, let me scoot, let me get this on screen in just the right spot now. Okay. Get some of that glare out of the way. Sorry about that. In this case, let's walk through this. This plan or this, this problem said, imagine you're accelerating downwards. If you're accelerating downwards with this magnitude, A should be a positive number. What does the scale read? Remember, scales don't read your weight. They read your tension or normal force. Just like we saw in those videos of me jumping up and down on the scale. Sometimes it reads the correct weight. Sometimes it reads a different value. This scale... If you're accelerating downwards, should the scale reading be larger or smaller than my weight? Smaller. Smaller. And if you're accelerating upwards, that would be basically A is a negative number. That would like add a little bit. So if you're, if you're accelerating upwards, the scale should read larger than your weight. If you're accelerating downwards, the scale uh, reads less than your weight. What if... Under what circumstances does the scale read your true weight? When it's still. And I'm going to say false. Not because what you said was uh, incorrect, but is not fully correct. The scale will read the correct value when you are at rest. That is a true statement, but it's not the only story. What else? Your acceleration is zero. So you can be moving, but not accelerating. Example, say you're in an elevator. You're at the first floor. You're going to go up to the second one. Initially, the elevator accelerates from rest. If you were standing on a scale, 
it would read larger than your true weight. Then you're cruising at constant speed. During that phase, you're moving, your acceleration is zero, the scale reads the true weight, but you are moving. So uh, does that make sense? We've gotta be careful there. Uh, I don't, okay, hopefully that fixed up that. So in general, we say the scale reads your true weight if acceleration is zero, that's the shortest way to say it. That doesn't mean you can't be moving. You could be in dynamic equilibrium. All right, so in this case, what would the scale read if you're in free fall? What if we drop the scale? There wouldn't be any tension. Exactly. So in an effort to show that, let's see. We could just check these. So here it is while it's falling. And let me just kind of speed this up here. Now, the idea here, this minus sign is coming from this force sensor being upside down, but this is the correct tension magnitude. Right now, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a string right here and I'm stepping on it with my foot down at the bottom. That's what's keeping this. So right now, A is equal to zero. The tension is 12, so that means this is approximately a 1.2 kilogram mass. So this is approximately a 1.2 kilogram mass hanging right here. I'm gonna let go of it in a second and it's going to accelerate downwards. Watch the scale reading, okay? So let me do this, let me do this, and let me do this. Oh my gosh, am I still talking? Somewhere I let go of it. Sorry, I started too early, but I think it'll be fast if I just let it play at this point. Notice that scale reading drops. Now it's gonna hit the ground. And now when it hits the ground, oh look, I'm holding the bag right there. You can see that when it hits the ground, the scale reading drops essentially to zero right? Because the ground is supporting the weight once it hit the ground. But clearly we saw the tension drop. And if we go the other way, this is when it's accelerating up. Again, ignore that minus sign. That's just the magnitude. Somewhere in here, it actually starts accelerating up. I'm going to let go of it. Any day, Rob. Notice when it's accelerating up, the tension magnitude increases. Now I'm holding it again. All right, that's fine. And then here, <laughs> it's so blurry, you can't see it. I let go of it. Scale reads 10. Hopefully you saw that scale reading snap to zero in that split second. It did happen here. There's that scale reading. It's really hard to see. Right there, it did peg to zero. So when you drop this thing, it's in free fall. I'm not holding it anymore. And so when I drop it into that bucket, we see the scale reading. So this seems to match up to everything that we were predicting in this simple problem. All right. Yeah, all right, good. Glad you like the videos. It's, it's very time consuming. Um, but yeah, if it helps, right, I'm going to try to eventually link them to the right problems in the workbook and I'm, it just takes forever. So, um, yeah. Um, anyways, uh, this is probably a good time for some questions. And then if there's no questions, I think we should take a short break and come back. So, um, let me just see if there's any questions right now. Any questions about any of this kind of conceptually? When we come back, we're just going to do more practice problems. Um, if you practice this, students usually rock this part of the course. You get used to it, and this is like the part you can get good points on a test, okay? Guaranteed, this is going to be on your final exam, and yeah, so. 
Uh, Sorry, to recap, um, when you mm -hmm. let go on the, of the scale on S dot zero, that's because tension was zero. There was no longer a tension. Uh, that's right. So when you drop it, right, as soon as I let go of it, it's accelerating downwards with rate G. So let's do the math. It's literally this problem. If I accelerate downwards with rate G, if A happens to equal G, there's no tension in the scale. And that's what we saw in the video. Is that good? Yeah, gotcha. Pretty crazy, right? I guess if I had a higher speed camera, it probably would have been a better video, but you know, you do what you can do. All right. Um, others. All right. 555. Let's do it. That's one of my favorite numbers. 555. So I'll see you guys in uh, about 10 minutes. All right. Uh, I'll put that playlist in here in case you're curious um, before I get some more water. They're not in order. I need to work on it. Nah, it just takes so much time. Um, I don't know what this is. Whatever. I'll put some video in here. There we go. Yeah, well, my thought was eventually what I wanted to do with these videos is to re-record them with my students and have grant money pay for it and get somebody other than just an old white guy up here telling you kids what to do, you know? So, and obviously a lot of you are not kids. So yeah, it's like, I don't know, it'd be nice to have somebody other than me teaching you physics. And so eventually that is actually a plan. These are my rough draft videos figuring out where the camera needs to be, how the lighting needs to be, all that. It's so uh, tedious. <laughs> all right. Yep. I'll, I'll see you guys in about 10 minutes. All right.
All right, everybody, I'm back. <laughs> and my kids get a kick out of that. All right, here you go. Get out of here. Shut the door, will you? All right. All right. That was the wig party. All right. So I threw a couple of um, uh, video clips in there. I was talking about this last time. I finally got the chance to shoot shoot the monkey. Um, so if you want to watch those videos, uh, I'll shoot the monkey. Whoops. But um, it's pretty interesting that it works regardless of the bullet speed. And so uh, the first one shows you that if you aim directly at it, and you can see that. And the second one shows you um, that. So if you hadn't seen that, it's in the chat. You could watch that later when you get bored. Um, I got to, again, link those in the, <clears throat> in the solution somewhere. All right. So now I want to look at, um, I want to learn some practical tricks about this. And some of this might be, uh, you know, uh, if you want to, you could do this problem later and see what happens when the coordinate system is flipped. And it turns out you get something similar. Great. Um, in this case, I want to talk about 5.6, this question right here. All right. So 5.6, we've got a mass in equilibrium, uh, and it's shown in the figure. The mass is held up by a system of strings. And so if it helps, I wanted to just give you a visual on this. Um, let's go back to here. And let's go to, whoops. this one. So the idea right here, I don't know if you could see this. I just put a mass on there. So that's a one kilogram mass. And the big picture here is I'm going to, oh, let me just play it. So that scale is legit. I'm going to hook it on that washer there. And notice you see the scale readings change on everything. So just to be clear, watch the scale readings go up. Now, in this case, these are actually some pretty complicated looking uh, scales. So it's a little bit blurry here. But the idea is this is showing you the scale reading. And it looks to me like it's about 5. Point, I don't know, 5.3 Newtons. Maybe it's 5.2. And then here, I don't know if you could tell, this is a protractor. So this is 10, 20. This is about 30 degrees right here. Okay, and then up here, let me see if I can move some zoom stuff around. Notice here, the scale reading is very close to 10. So I'm gonna say this one's reading about 9.9 .9 Newtons. And the angle looks like it's 10, 20, uh, oh, actually this angle right here is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So this is about 60 degrees right here. And I'm trying to make this match up to something here. So let me see. Okay, so actually, so this angle right here is also 60 degrees. So let's use those 60 degrees. So I'm doing that just so this matches up uh, the problem I have. Now you might be saying, wait, should the problem matter if I use this 30 or 60 degrees? Not really, but I want you to get used to using both different directions here, okay? Now, one last piece of information here, just from watching this video, the scale reading down here at the bottom, it looks like it's about nine and a half. Now, the scale itself actually has another 1.5 uh, newtons of weight. So this one's actually more like uh, this tension in this string right here is uh, tension three is probably about 11 newtons. Now, I don't know exactly, I'm estimating. So again, the scale is reading the mass that's hanging way down there. So the mass that's way down there is about nine and a half plus the scale itself, the total tension in this string is 11 newtons. Now there's a little washer right here. That is negligible compared to these other forces. So the, the let me be clear what I mean. M of the washer, times g is approximately equal to zero compared to all these other uh, forces. So we could ignore the weight of the washer itself compared to everything else that we're hanging on it. That is what I'm talking about when I show you this problem.
Okay, we ignore the weight of the washer. We're saying that this one was about 11 newtons. This one up here is about 10 newtons. We saw that this angle was about 60 degrees. And now to make a problem out of this, what we're going to do is we're going to solve for T2 and theta. So we're going to try and figure out what this and that are. And then you could check it with real life in the videos. Okay. So that is what we are trying to get at here. So that is our goal. Next. Uh, in this pro, whoops, crap. In this problem, I think what I did, if you want to follow along with my color code, I'm going to use green for T1. I'm going to use blue for T2. So I'm going to use blue for T2. And I'm going to use black for T3. Okay, that's the color code that I use. Yes. All right. So, and now why am I giving you these weird angles? It's because in real life, sometimes you have a protractor and you didn't get to choose how it's aligned. And so in real life problems, we need to be able to handle angles drawn in all kinds of weird places. That's really what I'm trying to get at here. How do we handle angles now? Everything's been pretty much straight up and down. Now let's handle angles. First, somebody answer part A for me. Under what circumstances will T3 equal mg? A equals zero. If A equals zero, we just saw that. So in this problem, I can actually use T3 and mg interchangeably as long as acceleration was zero. Now we're told it's in equilibrium. This meets that uh, situation. Now we don't know if it's moving or not. You have no way of knowing Maybe I made this video inside an elevator that was moving at constant speed for 30 seconds. <laughs> Maybe I was in the Sears Tower last weekend that I didn't tell you and I was going up for a long time. But yeah, whatever. All right, good. All right, draw an FBD for the washer. I'm going to go ahead and do this with you, right? Because it's our first one. So this is what I'm going to do. I started it here just so I wouldn't forget what colors I said. Sorry, I kind of cheated here. So here is an FBD. I've got the washer. I've got a force going downwards. That's T3. I'm going to cheat and change that to MG because A equals zero because the word in the problem was equilibrium. When we see equilibrium in a problem, that's what tells us A is zero. Got it. And I've generally been color coding the acceleration as red. So I'll keep it that way. All right. Next, I gave you this angle and that angle, supposedly, in some weird video. Okay, great. Well, I need to split these vectors up. Most often, most people think of a normal coordinate system being X and Y. There are many, many cases when we wouldn't want to do that. But for this problem, let's assume we're using a normal XY coordinate system. Start easy, right? I'm going to label the acceleration over here, not in the picture, separate. All right. So clearly, I need to split up the green and the blue one. I need to split up these two because they don't line up with the coordinate system. This one, I don't need to split it up. It already lines up with one of the axes of my coordinate system. So in this case, I draw little arrowheads here indicating left or right. And so I'm going to zoom in here just for this part. In this case, what is this side? It's either going to be T cosine or T sine. Now think, Sokotoa, I'm opposite. Is it T sine theta or is it T cosine theta? Sine. Notice the X component sometimes gets sine theta. This is adjacent. Adjacent relates to cosine, so katoa. Now over here, we could do one of two things. You could just say, I'm going to split this vector up this way, up and to the left. Or you could say to the left, to the left and up. Now, normally we do it this way. 
so I will point out by alternate whatever angles in some geometry class, this angle's theta, or sorry, this angle's phi, this angle's phi. That means this side right here is T, oh, I should be careful. There's more than one tension. I'd better remember to label this as T2, right? If I don't label this, I might get it confused with this one. So I'll call this one T1 sine or cosine. 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 And then over here, D1 sine phi. Now just getting it back just a little so you can see the whole thing. There it is. So this is an FBD. I've drawn the object all by itself without the walls, the ceilings, without anything else. I draw only the forces acting on it. And then I draw a coordinate system separate from there because it gets so busy and I split these things up into components. All right, hopefully in this case, this one's pretty obvious. In the X direction, I'm gonna get this minus that. Now, if I write down a force equation, I want to be clear. When you say write down an equation, that means there better be equal something. Otherwise, that's not an equation, that's an expression. So when I ask for a force equation, it's not enough to say this minus that. We should say this minus that equals something. Let's do it. So in the x direction here, you're going to see me do this. Uh, you know what? I'm going to cheat. I'm going to make this shorter so I have room, okay? Sorry. All right, and I'm going to move this up here. All right, that allows me to have a little bit more room to write. That's all I'm doing. And that allows me to scoot it here, which allows me to do this and go back to there just a little bit. Here we go. Here we go. So sorry for that glare. In this case, let's talk about the x direction. T2 sine theta. Notice how important it is with problems that have more than one angle to clearly state if you're talking about a theta with a horizontal line or phi with a near vertical line. Next, T1 cosine phi. Now, what I'm gonna do is the arrowheads relative to the coordinate system, it's the combination, tell me the plus minus sign. This is to the right, I said to the right is positive, that makes this positive. This is to the left. I said to the right is positive. That makes this negative. There's no more forces left or right equals. I type mass times acceleration in the x direction. Okay, we're doing an x equation. I use the x component of acceleration. What is the x component of acceleration for this cheesy little problem? Zero. 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 And it's zero for both of them. So this goes to zero. Done. That's one equation. Write down the sum of forces in the y. See if you can beat me to it. You're faster than I am. You could do this. Sum of forces in the y. Plus. plus there we go acceleration in the y direction is also zero hopefully you got that I'm gonna pause for questions. Sweet. And you could ask at any time, I have no idea. Um, now remember, if you've already had me for class and you know these problems, you can race ahead. You know exactly the problems I'm asking you to do in that list of problems. So you can, you know, if this is too easy for you, you could race ahead but some people might be their first time having a class with me and they want to you know, see this stuff and understand my little 
nuances. All right, so that said, that's parts A, B, and C. So now I'm going to go to the solutions to save some time. 5.6. So here, you do so much work to get these three parts in that picture. Next, there are two standard problems. So um, let me go back to that question here and show you. The idea is assume T1, phi, M, G are known. Solve for T2. Wait, no. Oh, I'm supposed to solve for theta and eliminate T2. So sometimes you want to know what direction you need to pull to keep this thing balanced. So that would be what direction. That's like a theta. What theta do I need to apply a force at? Okay. And part E says, how strongly do I need to pull? Forget about the direction. Just how much do I need to pull? Right? So what force do I need to balance this? So let's go in and see. These are very reasonable questions. How much should you pull and in which direction? If we know that, we could balance this or cause a spacecraft to accelerate or do something. So they're very useful questions. Whoops, I went to the wrong button. I need to go to this one. So here is one way to do it. If you set up these equations and you solve for the blue variables, right? You solve for T2 sine theta and T1 is on the other side. So again, all I did was I took this crap, moved it to the other side, take this crap, move it to the other side. That's what I did right here and right here. I stack those equations and take a ratio. When you take the ratio, boom, the tension drops out and on this side you get tangent theta. On the other side, you have a big, ugly mess. Well, theta is equal to tangent inverse of that big, ugly mess. And there's not much you could do. You just, the T1 doesn't, can't, it's just ugly. So what? And the units do check out, so you could check that later. But notice, the second way of writing it is easier to check the units. No units, no units, force over force no units. Tangent inverse of something with no units has no units. That's why I wrote it the second way. For me, it makes sense. It's easier to check the units. Everything has no units. Okay. Now you could do this algebra later. Let's focus on getting the tricks down. Basically, sometimes you're supposed to take a ratio and that can drop out a variable. Great. Next. Part E, very similar. In this one, we were supposed to find the force magnitude, not the angle. Oh, let me see what the chat is. Remember, mg is the weight force. The tension right here is equal to mg. So, right, mg comes from tension 3. This is essentially tension 3 downwards. Got it? Oh, okay. I got, got it. it. Yep. Okay. So now, yeah, this is not MA. This is not accelerating with rate G. MG is the weight of this. So that's subtle. Acceleration is zero, but this tension happens to equal that thing's weight, which relates to its free fall acceleration, even though it's not in free fall. Next, down to here. Let's say we're trying to get T2. You set up the equations the same way, right? You isolate the unknown crap, then you square them. Now, if you square one side, you got to square both sides. It's big, it's ugly, so what? After you square both sides, you can add them together. When you add them together, you get sine squared plus cosine squared, which is equal to one, and so you get T squared, right? This drops out. You could take the square root of both sides. And then in this case, we're assuming the tension should be positive because it's a magnitude and you get this long result and you could go on further and further and simplify that if you want. The point being, you could use this and that video to check your results. So if you want, you could see if, okay, 
according to all that work, if I know that the, the tension three down was 11 Newtons and that other one was 9.8 or 9.9 .9, and you know all the angles, you could check it and see if it works. You could see what you predict for T2 and see what you predict for the angle. And then later on, you could see if you actually get it. All right. Um, and it'll be close, but it's never perfect. In the real world, there's always subtle differences in reading the angles and measuring the masses and things like that. So um, don't be surprised if it's off by one in the second sig fig. Okay. So like, let's say you predict uh, 32 degrees or something and you get 35. That's, that's totally reasonable. That's only a few percent. Okay. Um, questions on that? Sweet. Let's do another one. It's very common that we need to handle angled ramps. And you might be saying, oh, I had a physics class. I hated blocks on inclined planes. Turns out blocks on inclined planes are very useful because it sets us up for things in circular motion, which if you think about any real device like a car, there's a lot of circular motion going on. If you want to understand moving mechanical parts for mechanical engineer, this will, very, this will help you out later. So without further ado, let's go look at a problem. Let's look at, uh, 5.7 is a fun one. You should look at the answer to that one. It's fun. Zombie pulling a suitcase. If you've ever wondered about zombies pulling suitcases in elevators, this is the problem for you. Great. Let's start with zombies pulling suitcases up a ramp. Very different problem. Much, much more important. So <laughs> whatever. All right, so 5.9. Now, you could do this a lot of ways. I want you to do it the way I'm going to tell you to do it. So I'm going to actually share my screen while we do this. So this is on page 86. So if you've got your workbook open to page 86, look at 5.9, and I'm going to start this one. 5.9, 5.9, there it is. Let me get it up back to speaker view, let's lower this down. Okay, 5.9, I'm not gonna forget the problem for once. So hopefully now you see the merits of the workbook, right? The idea is if you have that, you could be reading while I'm wasting time trying to get cleaned up the board and stuff. So that was the whole point of this workbook was so that you could be learning while I'm erasing or something. Okay. So now there's a block on a plane. I'm going to draw that block as a dot and I'm going to draw the plane for right now. And I want you to do the same thing as me here. I want you to exaggerate this angle as a very small angle. I want to make sure it doesn't look like 45 degrees. Okay. Now, we could draw this in all kinds of ways, but it turns out for a large number of reasons that might not be obvious, I want to call this the x-axis. We're gonna use a rotated coordinate system and that makes this the y-axis. Now, some of you in high school would actually turn your paper or just trust me, I know what I'm doing. I've written whole books on this. Just listen to me and do what I say. All right. I want you to pass. So trust me here. This is the right coordinate system to get used to for these types of problems. Now, we are told uh, that there's a zombie pulling on it this way with some tension T, and this is some angle phi. We're also told this ramp down here that this is angle theta, and these two angles may not be the same. If you've ever walked up a ramp pulling a suitcase, I don't know, that's kind of a weird thing to do. But if you did that, it's very plausible to think the angle of the ramp might not be the same as the angle of your string. So there's no reason to think these two angles should be the same. That's, again, we have to be very careful with thetas versus fees, because in real life problems, more than one angle could appear. Next, let's think about some other forces on this. What is another force exerted on this suitcase? Gravity. Gravity. That's going to go straight down. All 
all right? And gravity, that's another name for weight, and that's represented by magnitude mg. So this is the weight of that, of that uh, in terms of the magnitude. And then what's the other force acting on this? Normal force. Normal force. Normal in mathematics means perpendicular. So the remember, this is basically the direction of the ramp. The normal force should be perpendicular to that. Okay. So if I could, right, here's the surface. The normal force points perpendicular to the surface. If you angle the surface, you're also angling the normal force. So think of the normal force as pushing the same way. If it helps, you can think of your hand as being the surface. Your hand is gonna push that way. So here it's pushing this way. It's pushing perpendicular to the surface. There might also be friction parallel to the surface, but we're gonna worry about that in the next class. All right, so there's a normal force this way. Now I'm gonna use a lowercase n for the magnitude of the normal force. Mg for the magnitude of the weight force, T for the magnitude of this tension in that weird zombie string. Now there's no friction in this problem. How do I know? I think it said so. I'm gonna verify that. Let's go back and look at this. Friction is negligible, you see that? Mass of the suitcase is M. Okay, we got all that. Do we know anything about the acceleration? Yes or no? Yeah, it's zero. It says How do you know that? Speed. Ah, okay. So if it's moving with constant speed in a constant direction up the ramp, right? It's moving up the ramp, constant speed. If the direction and the magnitude are not changing, velocity is not changing. If velocity is not changing, acceleration is zero. So we are told, I'm just kind of cleaning this up now. We have constant velocity, which implies acceleration equals zero. So just to clarify and get some symbols, and I'm just gonna get rid of this Y so it's not so confusing. All right, so this is one plausible way to do the FBD. I argue it's the, well, this is the way I do all of my work. So if you wanna understand my solutions, that's really the reason to learn this, okay? So I want you to succeed and I want you to be able to understand my solutions when I'm not around. That's what we're doing here. Okay, now, when we use this coordinate system, which forces need to be split up? Which forces don't line up? This one and that one, right? So, well, watch carefully now, everybody. Watch carefully. So the most common mistake people make right here is they'll say, well, I'm going to split up MG like this. This is wrong. This is incorrect. Look, the components need to be smaller than the original vector. And I hope you could see that if I did that, this one would be longer than that one. Clearly, that's wrong. Okay. The other thing is the components need to be parallel to these axes. So I need to split this up this way. This one goes down and this way. All right. Now, what is this angle? There's a trick. You look at it. Doesn't it look a lot like theta? This is a tiny little angle. If you draw your triangles with tiny angles, it's usually obvious that this is theta and this must be some other angle. Here's another way to see that. This is a right angle. Well, the sum of the angles inside of a triangle are 180. Well, if this is 90 of them, that leaves 90 degrees for these two. That means these two angles are complementary. Said another way, what's this angle right here with a double bar? 90 minus theta. 90 minus theta. Now, 
these two angles are also complementary. Let me get a pointer here. This angle and that angle. Right? This is a right angle right here. That is a right angle. So what's this angle right here that I drew with two dots? Theta. That's theta. So now this helps us out. What's this side right here? Is it mg sine or is it mg cosine? It's opposite. So katoa. What is it? Mg sine. Mg sine. This side is adjacent mg cos. I'm gonna pause. The trick here is if you draw your angle really small, it gives you a visual check on your work so that you don't have to go through all that crap every time. If you draw a small angle here, you could have just jumped right to here, boom, boom, you're on to the next problem. So that's what experience does for you when you practice these. If you draw every angle as 45 degrees, not only do I wanna strangle you, but also you make more mistakes. And that means you have to see me more often and nothing could be worse than that. I mean, come on. Ooh, another, ooh, no one wants to listen to me on Zoom. It's even worse in person. All right, so yeah, just draw skinny angles. You'll see the answer and you'll get more problems right. That's what I'm saying. Now, technically this is a busy diagram. I'm gonna actually erase these lines now just so I don't have this big mess when I'm trying to understand my work. Now that's probably a little bit hard for you, but we get the idea here. This is usually what I would draw. I wouldn't draw all that other crap. Oh shoot, I forgot to split up tension. And so this side would be T adjacent, adjacent cosine, phi. This side would be T sine phi. I'm going to pause. Any questions? That was a lot of stuff. Nice. And remember, you've got the solution. So there's, and in fact, let's actually take a look at the solutions. Well, actually, you could figure out, let's write the force equation before we look at the solution. All right. What's the force equation in the X going to be? Somebody maybe that hasn't spoken up today, go ahead and give it a shot. I promise I won't harass you. Just give it a shot. Try. And you usually learn more by trying, even if you fail. And it's okay to fail. This is early in your, your career here. What do you think? Give me a force equation in the X direction based off this crazy looking picture. Would it be T, T cosine of the uh, D? Is that what you say? Yep. T. Plus T sine of D? No. This one's oh. in the X. This one would be in the Y. Good thought, good thought. What's another one that's in the X direction? Mg sine theta. Oh yeah, no. yeah. Yeah, so is that plus or minus in this case? Minus. Minus. Nice, good job. Is there anything else X in the X direction? I have to look. Uh, I think that's it. So now we have to write an equation. What is this all equal to? Uh, M -A. M -A -X. M -A -X. And in this case, it happens to be zero. Now I'm trying to get you in the habit of writing that because some problems, obviously AX is not zero and then that's what you figure out. Or maybe you know that and that helps you figure out a force. All right, let's do the Y direction now. Let's see, uh, according to this coordinate system, go ahead. Give it a shot, somebody. That would be um, the no normal force. Yes. Plus. Is normal force plus or minus in this, this case? 
Uh, it would be plus. Correct. Then what? Plus T sine V. I think so. Let me double check. Correct. Minus mg cosine theta. Okay. Is that all the forces in the y direction? Yes. Right? One, two, three. So we're done. So we say equals what? Zero. Yep. Or mass. And I'm going to just do it this way just to get in the habit, which happens to be zero, right? Nice. Good job. All right. I appreciate that. So that gets us rolling. So far, so good. Let me check the chat. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I just saw that now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mark, you were on it. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. You Okay. You got it. All right. You got it. Cool. Just checking the chat there. Yep. Cool. Next, you could do the rest of this problem, but this is the hard part. After this, you read the question, look what it says to solve for, solve for it algebraically, plug in numbers if you got them. All right, let's do another one. The setup is where we need to spend our time. Let's do this one right here. So again, you could do the rest of these details later. Like in 5.9, it says, just figure out this crap. I think you could figure that crap out. Okay, it's doing algebra. You've got the solutions. You could do it. So let's look at 5.10 now. You draw what you think, write the force equations. I'll do the same. Okay. Ah. Man. Let's see if that looks about right. Close enough. Okay. A good picture helps you do your work. So try to put some time and effort into your picture there. Let me read. Accelerates down the incline. All right. Okay. I'll give you a second to work, right? So try to try to get this to go. Try to not look at the solutions. You know you've got them. So if you get in a pinch and you have to leave afterwards, don't worry, you've got it later. Just give it an honest try and try to learn. Okay. So I'm gonna share my board with you in another one minute.
All right. So hopefully you had a chance to kind of get your brain wrapped around it. This is my start. I have not done the whole thing, but we could whip it together really quickly now. So this is what I drew to kind of get a feeling for it. I draw the angle approximately like it appears in the figure. It looks like it's supposed to be a large angle. So I drew it as a large angle. Then I use that. I notice the normal force is perpendicular to that slope. Okay. And this force is horizontal. And now what I'm going to do is kind of clean this up a little bit. Um, in this case... By drawing this picture approximately to scale, generally speaking, you can learn something. We see that the component of force from mg perpendicular to the plane is small. Okay, that's cool. Now, in this case, uh, let's say if this is theta, this is 90 minus, this is 90 minus, this is theta. I can see it. And now that I've got that, I'm going to even go one step further. Look at this. If this is theta, what's this angle? What's that angle? Theta. That's also theta. You could tell because of a alternate uh, parallel lines theorem or whatever in geometry, whatever. You could also see, look, if this is theta and this is 90 minus, I'm going to, just so I have room here, this dot is going to represent 90 minus theta. Well, this is theta. This would be 90 minus. This is theta. And look, you could actually keep going around and around and around. Alternate interior or whatever, that's theta. This is 90 minus alternate interior. And if you see this, every other angle is a theta. Every other angle is a 90 minus. So this is a trick with these horizontal forces on inclined planes. This happens a lot with cars driving on bank curve problems and things that we'll learn later. Okay. So now I'm going to get rid of some of this stuff that we don't need. But now I could see this is mg sine theta because it's opposite. This is adjacent, mg cosine theta. Up here, remember, you want your components to be parallel to the axes, right? So up here, this would be F uh, opposite, sine theta. And you can see it starts to get really crazy if you try to always think the X component should have a cosine. You just got to just kind of roll with it and accept what life gives you. Sometimes the X component is that. Now, again, some of you are used to rotating this on its side in high school physics. They'll do that where you just turn this whole thing rather than rotating the coordinate system. In my experience, it's handy to have your picture accurately reflect the picture that you're working from. And it's handy to have your actual working pictures reflect the real life orientations of objects. Because sometimes somebody might not realize you rotated, would think you made a mistake and unrotated in their mind. And so if you draw your pictures exactly the same way it's oriented as a real life object, I think you make fewer mistakes. Could you get away with it the other way and possibly get full credit? Sure. Could you screw it up? Yes. Have I seen many students screwed up? Yes. That's why I tell you to do it this way. Not because it's right. It's because it seems to get most students more correct answers on test day. <sighs> All right. There is this ugly looking picture. From there, the rest is easy. Everything relies on getting the picture right. If you can't draw these pictures right, you're not going to get these problems. If you do get these pictures right, you're going to ace them every time. There's no, right? If you screw up one arrow, you're going to miss a lot of points, okay? There's just no leeway there. That said, let's go see if there's anything interesting in the solution to check out. Uh, that was five, six. 
I like that warning. Real life does not always match our simplified models. Okay, cool. Uh, that's the elevator one. Here it is. Okay, so hopefully you get something that looks a little bit like these equations. And here is something interesting. You might be saying, well, wait, dude, look at this, look at this right here. I don't know if you could tell, that's exactly the opposite of what I drew on my page, right? We were doing 510. Oh, whoops, thank you. Well, it's because we weren't doing that problem. Great. Thank you. Hey, there we go. <laughs> oh, but my point that I was going to make was this. Maybe you didn't draw this the same way as me. That's okay. What if you had drawn it like this and like this? You could do that. You could say this is X. You could say this is Y. And you could say this is A. If you do that, right, you should get the same final answer as me. So if you're wondering, it's okay to choose your coordinate system differently than me. We should get the same final answers regardless of our coordinate system. So we should get the same answers here. Now, what happens if you flip the coordinate system? If you flip the coordinate system, that would make this negative, this positive, and it would also make this negative. That's the same as multiplying by negative one. It shouldn't do anything. So if you flip the coordinate system, we get the same equations too. And you should have the same algebra, maybe with a minus sign on every single term. All right. So question. Yeah, go for it. So knowing that the acceleration, it's not a force. It's always have, we have to always draw it in the coordinate system. You don't have to, but that's what I recommend. Just so that I, I don't want people to draw it on here and think it's a force. Okay. All right. Now, Mathematically, mass times acceleration has units of force. And later on in, this, uh, in the next chapter, I'll explain there is actually a way you could correctly use the acceleration as a force in some sense, but mm. that would be fictitious. And so it's called a fictitious force. Basically, you could get the same answers here. Think about this. You're going to get a bunch of crap, blah, 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 equals MA, right? Couldn't you just say it's a bunch of crap minus MA equals zero? Do you agree that would be the same thing? Yeah. Well, that's the same thing as saying, well, if your acceleration is pointing this way, I could actually draw a force in this picture this way with magnitude MA. Right? Opposite direction. Yeah. <laughs> and that would be, and then you wouldn't need this. But that's a terrible idea. I'll leave it at that. However, we will see there's one problem in chapter 12. We actually use that technique. And what you could do is you could take a problem with acceleration and change it to a problem with no acceleration by doing that. And then you could use the techniques of chapter 12, which is static equilibrium. So there are rare cases where you might actually want to do that. If you saw your high school physics teacher do that, that's why. It's a good technique for certain special problems. Generally speaking, <sighs> makes me want to puke. Got it? Hopefully that made some sense. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, in rare cases, you could actually put the acceleration on there, but let's not get in that habit. Good question. Others? Acceleration means something to me. It has to do with its change in velocity. So I don't want to, I don't want to multiply that by mass and lose that physical meaning. And if you don't multiply by mass, you can't put it in your FBD. Okay. All right. All right. We're almost done here. Let's see where we're at. Oh, uh, let's actually look at this one. So there's some numbers on this one. Uh, this is kind of fun. I'm going to show you two last videos and then we'll get out of here. So um, let me escape out of here today. Okay. So what will happen is... I want you to think, I'm going to do this same demonstration, but I'm going to change the angle. So in this case, we're doing the same exact demo, putting this on here. The strings might be at slightly different angles now, but whatever. So what I'm going to do, let me pause for a second. So in this case, hopefully you could read these scale readings. Again, this might be slightly different. Actually, it's about the same as before, right? So this one's reading about 5.2 Newtons. 
this one up here is reading about 9.8 newtons. I'm just eyeballing it. I know these scales so I could read it. That's a nine, that's a 10. You probably can't see it, but you could tell it on this one. See that nine and 10? All right. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this rod and I'm gonna move it upwards. When I move it upwards, this string is gonna change the angle slightly, but the angle will remain approximately constant. It's gonna change a little bit, but not much. So assume the angle stays approximately constant. What should happen to these force readings if I, okay, so what, ah, what should happen to this 5.2 and that 9.8 if I keep the mass the same and I cruise this upwards? Think to yourself, and let's see what happens. I hope you saw that. Notice in this case, the tension on the upper scale went down. So this tension went down and this tension went up. Does that seem reasonable? We're trying to balance this thing. If you try to balance this thing, this now has a larger vertical component. This one can then have a smaller vertical component. And notice the angle really didn't change that much on this side. So we see that we expect the magnitude of this force to drop significantly because this one on the right is now supporting more of the weight. Seems reasonable, right? Hopefully. And let's get out of here and show you one last one. Maybe. Oh, there's a chat. Ah, uh, so if if they have the same height and same angle, yeah, they'll equilibrate. And that's question 5.6 and a half. So if you have the same height and angle, that's question 5.6 and a half, it should work out. Uh, they have exactly the same. So now if I could get out of here, maybe, come on. Oh, I raise it up some more and you can see the effect gets even more dramatic there. So we're getting closer and closer to the same uh, height. We, uh, yeah, it will eventually equilibrate there. So now, what was the other one I wanted to do? Where is it? Let me get to my playlist here. Sorry, if you got to take off and don't want to sit here and watch this, you don't have to, but I'm almost there. Vector demo one, which flies off first. Wait, I need to go back one more. One more. One more, there we go, is this the, okay, so we got the vector demo. Oh my gosh, where is this damn thing? <sighs> Sorry, I got so many videos, it's hard to keep track of them all. Make sure I'm in the playlist, there we go. Now I'll be able to find it. Get this, oh my gosh, zoom. Ah, it's not letting me move this damn thing. Okay, control alt shift H, that'll work. All right, now I'm on it. Sometimes zoom just makes me want to strangle something. This one, all right, there we go. So in this case, if you look, just to summarize this, we've got a, a scale here and let me get this here. Oh my gosh, it takes so long to do this. There's a scale here that's gonna read the normal force and there's a scale here that's reading the tension. So this scale is reading the tension. So the idea is I'm gonna take this whole thing and I'm gonna change the angle, I'm gonna lift it up. I want you to think about what should happen with the normal force and the tension as we lift this. That is the question I wanted to address here. So let's go ahead and hit play here if I can find the right spot in the video. So again, the tension on here, ignore this minus sign. We're just gonna look at the magnitude of this, which is about three, and the magnitude of this. Now keep in mind, this is reading kilograms. So this is approximately 14 
newtons because we got to multiply by about 10. That's a 1.4 kilograms, which is about 14 newtons. So as this thing goes up, think to yourself, what should happen? Let's hit play. Oh, we're on normal speed. Somewhere I'm actually going to lift this thing up. Looks like I'm about to actually move it now. Okay, come on, come on, Rob. Any day now. There it goes. So notice we see that that scale reading, the normal force drops and the tension magnitude goes up. Ignore that minus sign. All right, so hopefully, oh my gosh, if that didn't scare you away, I don't know what will.